So last class, we spent time worrying about something that didn't matter, which is what the graph of this function f looks like. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, we're bounded above by this function. It doesn't matter what the actual shape is. What we have, what we have to do is write down the region and know about our region, which we've already done. So, <clears throat> so it's below by the unit circle. Uh, I, we did start talking about level sets, so let's just get a real rough sketch of it. It's not super important for what we're doing. So F inverse of zero is a circle with radius three. Let's look at some other values. I'm just going to pick the letter B here. So we have B equals 9 minus x squared plus y squared. And then let's go ahead and add x squared plus y squared to the other side equals 9 minus B. In this form, it should be able to, it should be clear what are some good choices of B that are nice squares. So 8 would be a really good choice because then x squared plus y squared equals 1. 9 is a good choice because it will equal 0. So let's go f inverse of 9, f inverse of 8. What's another good choice? Let's see, 9 minus 5 is 4. I like that. And then we already did 0. I think that would be all the good ones out there. Now, the reason I solved it the way I did, you can just see if you plug in 9, we have x squared plus y squared equals 0. So it's basically all the algebra is already done for us. Now, f inverse of 8. Here, b is 8. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 9 minus 8 is 1. That's the unit circle. Now, it's not the unit circle where your z-coordinate is 0. It's your unit circle where your z-coordinate is 8 because we picked our z-coordinate. On f inverse of 5, so 9 minus 5 is 4. So here radius is 2, radius is 0, somewhere up here radius r equals 3. So we got 0, 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> Let's turn these level sets into a graph. So what I'm going to do first is graph with a top-down view. This will be the x and y axis. So radius 0 right here, radius 1, radius 2, and radius 3. Now instead of labeling these with the radius value, I'm going to label them with the b value. So the Biggest one is b equals 0. Uh, when I write b, I really mean that's a z-coordinate. So here's our z equals 0. The next smaller radius 2 is z equals 4. The unit circle is z equals 8. And the origin, z equals 9, right there. Any questions about these level curves I drew out? Just pick and z coordinates, and this is what it will look like. <clears throat> so what you're looking at, the origin is going to have be at height 9, or z coordinate 9. And then one down from that, you'll have a unit circle. And then 6 down for that, when z is, or 5 down for that, when z is 4, you'll have a circle radius 2. And then a circle of radius 3, when z is 0. So let's draw that out. In three dimensions. Uh oh. Was 
Z. Yeah, sorry, when our radius is four, Z is five. All right, so Z is nine. We have a point right there, that's our Z equals nine. Now Z is eight. I will have a circle of radius one right there, z equals eight, z equals five right here. So there was eight, and when z equals five, we have radius two. Z equals zero, we have radius three. So this is similar to an upside down cone. It's not, the sides are not linear, so it's not exactly a cone. I think it'll be a little closer to a paraboloid, a parabola rotated around. But this is the shape we're looking at. Now what I'm gonna do <clears throat> is draw the region R that's on the XY plane, where we're, up, we're above, somewhere around here, above the unit circle on the XY plane. So I'm gonna draw that in blue. So it's right here, but it's only the unit circle. So we wanna be below this cone shape, but above the circle. So what that means is we're only gonna be using the blue area or the blue volume that I'm tracing out, including the cone at, or the nose cone at the top. So that's really the shape that we're going for. So we're not going to be using any of this outer part right there. So our actual domain, our actual region is the unit circle down there at the bottom. So any questions on our graph? So let's go ahead and compute this. So we have the double integral fxy dA over R. Looking at the graph, how do we know polar coordinates could be reasonable here? So it's got some circularness to it. Really our region is a circle. Not, it's not even part of a circle, it's just a circle. So right away, I can tell the theta is gonna go, you can pick any full uh, period you want. I'm gonna go zero to two pi. So I need to wrap all the way around. And what will the radius be? I'm just looking at this circle right here. What will the radius, what's the minimum radius? Zero, maximum radius? One. So just think you're making a windshield wiper, but this time it's spinning all the way around in a circle. So that's how you want to imagine this. So our region, we're gonna have theta between zero and two pi, and r between zero and one. Now our function, is nine minus x squared plus y squared. And we wrote the formulas down earlier, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So we can just easily take out x squared and y squared and replace it with r squared. And this is f of r, because it's now a function of r. Same function, but it represents the same thing, just takes a different input. So we're going double integral over r. It's now f of r dr d theta. What mistake did I make? There's a missing r. So don't forget, you get the extra r for free right there. So our inner bounds are the radius zero to one, the outer bounds, the theta zero to two pi. B 
because we spent a long time graphing, you know there's symmetry. But I would recommend if you don't have lots of time to graph this out, I would just not use symmetry. So symmetry becomes more dangerous the more dimensions you're in. So if you have a two-dimensional integral, you can use symmetry if you know the graph, but I recommend try to avoid it unless it's really obvious. This particular integral is super easy. So it's just anti-power power rule. You do have to multiply first. Once you distribute, you have a degree three polynomial. You use the anti-power rule. So this integral is easy to do. So ready for our last example in this section. So looking for the oh, we're gonna be looking for area. Thought we wanted volume. So area of the region R. So it's gonna be enclosed by x squared plus y squared equals four. So right there you can tell why it might be in the polar coordinate section. We're looking at a circle. We're above the line y equals 1 and below the line y equals square root 3x. <clears throat> so step one, graph out the region. So do that right now. Graph this out. Your line's a little bit weird. The only thing weird about your line is the slope is not an integer, but you should be able to handle that now. Square root three is bigger between one and two. I think it's about 1.73, so just estimate what your slope actually is when you're drawing it. The slope will probably be something about like that steep right there. I was wondering a minute ago why this does not look like a polar rectangle whatsoever, what I was drawing. What did I do wrong? Yeah, I graphed the y equals square root 3, not y equals square root 3x. <laughs> so let's graph that properly. It has a y-intercept of 0 and a slope a little bit bigger than 1, not quite 2. So it's going to look something like this right here. Below the line I drew, which does keep going, below the line I drew and above the other line y equals 1. So my region is now that shape right there. <clears throat> Now 
This is not a perfect polar rectangle. If it was a polar rectangle, I'll draw some stuff in t on top. Do not copy what I'm about to draw in yellow. But if this was a polar rectangle, the closest shape it could have would be something like this. That would actually need to be a little bit bent, but something like that would be the shape it would have if it was a polar rectangle. It had to be some version of pizza crust. We don't have that. So let's set this up in rectangular coordinates first, because that's how all the information was given. So set up the area in rectangular coordinates. Hopefully you didn't forget. I know that was two sections ago. Now I want to warn you, in rectangular coordinates, you do need to partition this in half because your upper function changes on the left and the right half. You have two different upper functions, or big functions. So you have to split this in half. It looks like they intersect when x is 1, but that could be a coincidence of my bad graph. So I just sort of arbitrarily drew that uh, y equals square root 3x line. There's a very good chance it doesn't intersect at 1. How do we find out where those intersect? Set them equal. So let's do that first. So I want to intersect y equals square root 3x with which other equation? There are two points of intersection I could find, but I really want to get the top intersection point. So what other equation am I intersecting with? The circle. All right, so how do we intersect equations? I got two equations, two variables. So I want to know an x and y value that works in both equations at the same time. So one way is to solve for a variable in one and substitute it in the other. Well, let's solve for y in the first equation. Done. And plug in that version of y in the second equation. So I set all this up, x is plus or minus 1. So any algebra questions? All right, so plus 1 is the correct intersection value. My graph luckily is correct. What about negative 1? Looks like that line intersects the circle once. Where did the negative 1 x value come from? The third quadrant, if you actually make your line a line and not a line segment, you get a second intersection point right there. We're not using that one, we're just using the positive one. So we're just going with the plus. All right, find the other intersection point now, right here. It should be very easy. It's not one. A little less than one. So figure out what x coordinate that happens with. You have your two functions here, or your two equations. So you have to intersect them. Do the exact same thing. Solve for y, easy to do. Plug in that to the other equation.
So x is 1 over square root 3, somewhat close to a half, but you can type it in and get a decimal if you want, a little bigger than a half. <clears throat> All right, this should be enough information to write down the two Cartesian integrals that represent this area. So again, you have a left area and a right area. So we're all on the same page. Let's call the left area ooh, too big of a marker. We'll do left area A1, right area A2. So write down the integral for the area A1 and the integral for area A2 right now. Oh, there's a third x value you need to find. I'll let you find that on your own. You gotta do one more intersection. And it'll be somewhat close to two. It should be just a little shorter, a little smaller than two is that x value. So our area one, <clears throat> I went with dy dx, mainly because I already, the only reason I went that direction is because I already had my function of x. It's not hard to solve for x and have a function of y, but why do an extra step? We already found all the x coordinates we needed, so I just went with the dy dx integral. Oh, that's a good question. I did put one in there. So remember, we're actually finding a volume. When the volume equals the area, that means your height is 1. So we're basically finding the volume of a region, or volume of a prism where the base is this shape right here, and the height is 1. So if I drew the actual volume we're looking for, looks like that, and then it goes up, up, up. So that's basically the region we're finding, the, or that's the shape we're finding the volume of, which because the height is one, happens to equal, numerically equal the area. And I said that would really upset science people who like units, because the you can never say the area is equal to the volume if you care about units. Well, I guess you could say the area multiplied by the height is the volume. You could say that because the height includes a unit. All right, so A2 is way harder for one very specific reason. So it's the double integral of 1. I'm going to go dy dx again. So let's do the x bounds are easy. What is the little x bound? For, we're in A2 now. 
one, and big X bound, square root three. So usually your outer bounds are easier to think about. So we're going from one to square root three. Now your interior bounds, those need to be functions. These are y equals y equals. These need to be functions of x. What is your little bound for a2? It'll just be y equals 1. Now the big bound is the circle. But the circle's not written as a function of x. So the first thing we have to do is write the circle as a function of x using some algebra. So we said our little was y equals 1. So what I really need is y equals a function of x. So I have to solve for y. y squared equals 4 minus x squared. And y equals plus or minus square root 4 minus x squared. I do have to choose plus or minus. What choice do I make and why? Plus because it's the first uh, above the x-axis. So if we had anything below the x-axis, I'd be choosing the minus version. But we're above, so we're going plus. All right, so that is area one and area two. And of course, the area is the sum of those two areas. So add them together. So just looking at the integrals, area one looks like it will be easy to compute. Nothing too crazy. The only slightly tricky thing is plugging in that endpoint, but that's easy to do. Area 2 is a little bit more tricky. So let's go ahead and compute area 2, the actual integral, a little ways and decide if it's possible or impossible. Well, there's another way to compute area 1 without knowing calculus. It's a triangle. So base times height times a half. So there you go. You do need to compute the base and the height. Not too hard to do. They're not the base. We have all the x-coordinates we need for the base, so that's easy. The height's a little bit more complicated because I have the y value of 1. I do need to figure out my other y value, but that's easy to do. Just look at your intersection. So we're really going for a2. a2 is not any nice, shape, any nice part of a circle. So it's not a nice sector. There's really no nice formula to compute a2 using geometry because it's sort of a random little chunk of a circle. So we pretty much are stuck doing our integral. So let's do that. I am going to include the same green parentheses so that we just focus our intention on one at a time. You can also do the same thing by, if you have two index cards or really anything to cover up the outer parts right here. You could use your fingers, but you probably need at least one hand to write with. So you, anything that blocks that covers up those two. You just don't want to be looking in the wrong spot when you're doing your integral. All right, we got the integral of 1, so that's going to be y is the antiderivative, and then it's going to be the second minus the first, or n minus start. So I am skipping a step. I'm taking the antiderivative and plugging in endpoints at the same time. But I think we've probably done enough antiderivatives. That's okay now. I do not have an easy antiderivative. Negative one is super easy. That's not what I'm worried about. How do I deal with this square root? 
What's the first trick you should think about? Make a two squared. U sub. We could write as two squared minus x squared, but what's wrong with a u sub? What would be the only reasonable choices? I think there's only one reasonable choice, which is 4 minus x squared. So as soon as I get du, what's wrong with du? There's, n there's no way we're going to be able to deal with that x. So that's the reason u sub is going to fail. How do we get this antiderivative? Trig sub. What trig sub do we use? Get the cheat sheet out. All right, let's think about which trig sub to use. So I have 2 squared minus x squared. We want a trig function to replace x or x squared. So I always like to start with the easy one and then work up to the more difficult one. So sine, the sine cosine trig sub is easiest in my opinion. So let's think about that one before we break into the tangent cotangent or the secant cosecant. So we have sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals one. And I want this to look like a number minus function. So I'm going to subtract cos squared The other thing I need is the number to be 2 squared. So I'll multiply everything by 2 squared. So this is 2 squared minus 2 cos theta squared equals 2 sine theta squared. So I'm trying to do the trig sub without actually looking back at my cheat sheet to figure out exactly which sub to make. I could have written, if, if <clears throat> this does give me the form I want, because I have 2 squared minus a function squared. And it turns into just a function squared, which will cancel my square root. If this sine squared plus cos squared wouldn't work, the next one I have memorized, tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. This would have been perfect if I had 2 squared plus x squared. I would have used this guy. But I had minus, so I'm using the one we have written down. And if that tangent squared fails, then I use the secant squared, cosecant squared identity. That's my third choice. All right, so what uh, substitution am I making? What am I going to set equal to what? So I have to connect these two terms. So I'm going to let x equal 2 cos theta. So I want to take out x and replace it with 2 cos theta. And that means dx equals negative 2 sine theta d theta. I do not have a sine theta. Oh, but that's okay. That won't mess things up. All right, so we're ready to make this substitution. I can keep my x bounds because I'm not, oh no, I cannot keep my x bounds. Jeez, I'm placing x, turning x into some thetas, so I cannot keep the bounds. So I now have square root four minus, I'm going to put in x squared, which is four cos squared theta. And now I have negative 2 sine theta d theta. So 4 minus 4 cos squared theta is 2 sine squared theta, or 2 sine theta squared. Negative 2 can move out front. 
So two sine squared theta, or two sine theta squared square root cancels. That gives us two sine theta sine theta, or two sine squared theta d theta. So we have a sine squared antiderivative. We're going to use the reduction of power, also known as a double angle. So sine squared turns into 1 minus cos 2 theta over 2. And we're finally, well, I'll cancel the divided by 2 and the negative 4 to a negative 2. So from here, we'll do some guess and check antiderivative. So antiderivative of 1 is theta, antiderivative of negative 2 cos theta. I'm going to just naively guess negative sine 2 theta. So take my derivative, stays negative, but I pick up a multiple of 2. So I have to divide by 2 to get rid of that chain rule multiple I would get. Still don't have endpoints because I need to sub back. Uh, we do have a problem. <clears throat> so I'm going to write down our substitution, x equals 2 cos theta. So our main problem is we don't have cos theta anywhere. So we're going to have to very carefully, I'm going to solve for theta. X over 2 equals cos theta. Cos inverse x over 2 equals theta. That's what I sub out for my original theta. So we have cos inverse x over 2. Now sine 2 theta is a different story. I need my trigonometry cheat sheet, which I don't have with me. Is this 2 sine theta cos theta? Anybody remember from trig class? Or is this in your textbook? Oh, I have a textbook. Why am I asking you? Let's see what we got. The front of the book's pretty useless. Let's go 1.3 trig functions. Oh, here we go. So page 26, I have 2 theta equals 2 sine theta cos theta. Sine theta, I don't know, but cosine theta is x over 2. So now all I have to do is figure out what in the world is sine theta. All right, we're going to use triangles here. So cos theta is x over 2. So cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. How do I get my opposite side? So I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem. So it's going to be 2 squared minus x squared square root. That's my opposite side here. Or here, I'll just write, uh, I can't use y, because somewhere before we use y, let's go with uh, a. Right here. No, that's, that makes me think of adjacent. We'll go with b. x squared plus b squared equals 2 squared. b squared equals 2 squared minus x squared. So b is plus or minus square root 4 minus x squared. Oh, look at that. Now we do have to choose plus or minus. Pretty sure we're going to go positive. So we're in quadrant one. So everything X and Y should all be positive. So 
So we'll reduce it, cancel the twos. We have x square root, four minus x squared. And all of this mess is sine two theta. So we can now unsub our sine th two theta. And because we did all this work, we can now put in our endpoints. I'm totally. Is there also a minus one that you left up? I, that was what the minus, the cos inverse, what, what that. Oh, is there another minus one? At, at the very beginning before you did this, it creeps up. Oh, that one. Wait. Yes, that will be important. Yeah, so let's do that because it would involve too much erasing and not do that. So we're going to have integral 1 to square root 3. Now we have to be careful. Well, no, we don't have to be careful. X, there we go. Because that square root is what got really messy right there. So I can just break that negative one out. <clears throat> this is a super easy integral right here. It's just square root 3 minus 1 because the antiderivative is x and then n minus start. And we can write it as plus 1 minus square root 3, plus 1 minus square root 3. Oh, I just don't have room to write. All right, let's write this legibly on the next line. I am ready for the bounds because we're back in x's, so our bounds are now 1 to square root 3. We have plus 1 minus square root 3. It looks like our area is negative, which it shouldn't be. So there's at least a one error. Which one should be 2 pi over 3? So it's pi over 6 minus pi over 3, and then multiply the 2 in. Oh, so that should be negative? No. Yeah. Yeah. 
that. So that would be positive pi over 3, which is a little bigger than 1 plus 1 minus square root 3. So that would be positive. Barely positive, but. All right. So that's A2. You add up A1, and you get the total area. All right, so that was a lot of work, obviously, to fit it all on the screen. No problem. Oh my goodness. It doesn't let me zoom out far enough to get the whole problem on the board. So I'm going to predict that if we go into polar coordinates, it might be a little faster. That was a long excursion through calculus too, if you follow the entire time. So hopefully if we go with polar coordinates, it will be a much easier integral to actually integrate.